We're going to be in John 13 tonight. But I want you to see John 15, 7, which is this exhortation to abide in him. The word abide, remain, are the same. Stand with me if you would. I want to read these couple of verses to you, and then we will delve into the fourth and final phase of following Jesus day by day, wanting to learn from him to be. He's the ultimate disciple maker. We want to learn to be disciple makers ourselves. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Well, what is it? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Look at this. Abide. My words abide. It shapes prayer life, doesn't it? Thank you. Be seated. Let's, let's think about this together for a few minutes tonight. Jesus was clear about his purpose. We talked about that this morning going through, through Mark. And amazingly, he was never distracted from it. He was never distracted by being discouraged that the people he was pouring his life into were not getting it. He was never distracted by being, being frustrated that there were people who, who wanted to harm him, who, who misrepresented him, who lied about him, who, who scandalized him, slandered him. <clears throat> he never let it distract him, never let it draw him away from his focus. And he says to these disciples, and by the way, John 15 is a portion we're going to look tonight of what's called the upper room discourse. Give you a little context here. John gives us this only. Mark does not give us this. Matthew does not. Luke does not. When we, when we have the John 13 passage that we're going to delve into tonight, what you're going to see is that once Judas, the betrayer, has left the room, then Jesus teaches some things about leadership as disciple makers in 14, 15, 16, and then the high priestly prayer in 17, that it's the only place it's found in the New Testament, and it's only given, it wasn't even given to the 12, it's given to the 11. That's significant. So the call is to abide, to remain, to settle in. I told you last week, we were looking at some of these things that John's prologue to his gospel says the word became flesh. That is, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became flesh. He was the eternal Son of God. He took on flesh and he dwelt among us. And the word dwell is tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. He, he just pitched his tent is the, is the loose expression of that. He remained among men in his, in his ministry of three, three and a half years. And then he calls them to the end to remain in him. And the way they would remain in him, by the way, is if you want to, sometime this week, if you want to do some reading in this, read, read chapter 14, 15, 16, 17 of John's gospel. And what you're going to notice is he talks about sending the Holy Spirit. The way that we remain in him is the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, to be our teacher, and he leads us into truth. And that's what he says in our text we read earlier. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, that's not a laundry list of, you know, that has people abuse it today, but what he's telling us there is if we, if we remain in him, if we have communion with him, we talked about this morning about valuing him, treasuring him. If he, if he is, as the scripture says, Christ who is our life, if he is our life, then we feed upon his word. We, we take in large quantities of scripture not so we can check off that we've read large quantities of Scripture, but so we can have a steady diet of feeding upon the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God that transforms lives, the lives of those who have the Spirit in them. If we're doing that, then it shapes and affects our prayer life. When we ask whatever we desire, our desires are attached to His desires. We have confidence when we pray. And then he says this, my father is glorified. He's come to glorify the father. He's made it very clear about that. That you bear much fruit. And there's a lot of discussions about the fruit, but certainly the fruit is the, the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5. The fruit of, of, a, of a disciple who is abiding in Jesus. A, a disciple who is, who is obeying the word. A disciple who is making other disciples. That's, that's fruitful discipleship. 
And you prove by that that you're his disciples, he says. So let's, let's take a look. His hour has finally come. Look at John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. A very interesting statement about him here. How did he love them to the end? Well, immediately, in the immediate context, he shows them a manifestation of, of the role of a leader, of a disciple maker that was, was totally, that he turned notions about leadership on its head. Because I promise you, there wasn't a rabbi worth his salt, there wasn't a religious leader worth his salt who would disrobe himself and wash the feet of his students. He might expect his students to do that, to teach them humility. But Jesus comes in, so he, he gives them this example in John 13, the, the washing of the disciples' feet. But he, but he shows his ultimate love. He loves them to the end. He loves them at the cross. He shows them unmistakably his love by dying in their place. Jesus had been telling them for months now that he was coming to a great trial and now it's upon them. One writer says when you're looking at the chronology here it's less than 24 hours before the crucifixion. What is Jesus thinking about? Well in this upper room he is thinking about them. Their condition. He wants to show them the full extent of his love and give them an example. He calls it an example here in a few minutes. Just think for a moment. They had, they had laughed together. They had cried together. They would ministered to needy people together. They had been with him when he faced severe opposition. They'd eaten together, prayed together, fussed with one another together. He had rebuked them on a few occasions, and amazingly enough, they had attempted to rebuke him a time or two. But when you look through all of that and you say, what was the hallmark of Jesus' relationship to the twelve? One word describes it. Love. He loved them. He loved them. Whatever else they didn't know and didn't get, they knew that he loved them. And that is, that is so critical that we, that we practice that ourselves. That whatever people know or don't know about us, whatever they understand, don't understand, whatever they agree with or disagree with, they know that we, we have love. We're people who love one another. We love, we love God. That's what's part of our, our purpose statement. That's why we wrote it that way. Follow Christ. Sound like disciple making to me. Love God. Love others. Serve the world because serving the world is action that is a tangible demonstration of love. So here he is in this in this thirteenth chapter. He puts on the finishing touches of this of this time of education. Just think think back with me. Three years earlier. He had begun his ministry and with what one writer called curious converts. Where do you live? Where do you stay, Rabbi? I told you at the time that it lasted four months. Come and see. Then there was, a, he sent them away, remember they sent them back, and then there was a ten-month period. Come and follow me. Or for ten months they traveled with him. And he's establishing them as disciples in this, in this timetable. And then what we just finished this come and be with me phase, 20 months. If you remember the chronology we laid out for you. He's a transforming them and growing them into equipped laborers. To being curious, to being committed, to being equipped. And that's, the, that's the path. 
You can't make somebody be curious. But when you find someone who's curious, you ought to put the brakes on, stop right there, and begin to pour into their lives with the goal to see them become established as disciples and become disciple makers as equipped laborers. Now he's about to release them. So we're going to see and hear some, some principles of leadership in John 13 and other passages. So let's look on through John 13. John 13, 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and he had come from God and was going back to God. He's confident of the authority he has. Let me say parenthetically that as disciple makers, we need to be confident not of ourselves, but of our authority. There's a lot of people challenging this today. A lot of, a lot of folks are saying a lot of terrible things about the Bible today. It's our authority. It doesn't change. <clears throat> if it was true when it was written, and we believe it was true when it was written, then it's true today. It doesn't change. Societal circumstances don't change it. Jesus was confident in his authority. He is the word of God. We're confident in our authority, which is, which is the word of God. And we learn that from him. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going. Now, we don't have to know the details of tomorrow where you're going. I've had people through the years say, well, now you've got to just tell us what's down the road. Well, that would be nice if we could do that. But there's a goal that you're headed toward growing in the image of Christ, becoming more Christ-like, and your relationships loving others more like Jesus loves them, having truth shape you. Paul called it going from one stage of glory to another stage of glory. Jesus knew where he'd come from, where he was going. In his case, going back to the Father. Folks, we know if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we know where we are going. I told you about the, the Bible my, my dear precious mother, when, I, when the Lord first called me to preach, she gave me a Bible. I know what she did. She went to the, to the Baptist bookstore that was in our town in Beaumont, Texas, and asked them for a Bible, that her son was going to be a preacher. And so they recommended a Bible. It was a leather-bound Bible. She got my name on the front of it, Billy Askell at the time, you know. So there it was, stamped on there in, indelibly. And, and, but it was a... Uh, it was, I'm trying to think of the name of the Bible it was. It was the Bible that when you, you guys helped me out, I've just lost it. it. When you read it, it's got all these different explanatory phrases. Amplified. Amplified, thank you. It's the Amplified Bible, which is a wonderful study tool, by the way, because it, it does give you the nuances. But you can't read from that publicly, and you really couldn't preach from it. So the point is I used it for study, but I really never used it in the pulpit. But inside it, was an inscription she put. My son, my son, while I do not know the path your life will take, well do I know your guide. There's great value in, in that through the years. We know our guide. We know where he came from, where he went. We know that he is, that we are pressing on toward that. Uh, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. We are, we are running the race that's been marked out for us. That's the confidence with which we've got to live life as a disciple maker. If we're not careful, and I apply this to myself, if we're not careful, we're going to let the things that we don't know about circumstances, issues, details, challenges, the things that we don't know will bog us down. We've always got to come back to what we know. And that's where he has them that night. Look at verses 4 and following. Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments. And when he does that, folks, he has, he has basically... Another, the rabbi was marked in one of the ways by his, by his long flowing robe. It was, it was the mark of a teacher. And the others would have tunics. He takes that off. Not because he's ceasing to be functioning in the role of rabbi, but, but because he wants to teach them something that no rabbi would ever have taught them. And he has himself really in the, in the position of a servant. 
I've told you this before when we studied this passage on Sunday mornings in, in years past that, that washing the feet of guests in the home was one of, one of the lowliest uh, tasks of the servant. And they would graduate from that. As you got a new servant in the home, the pecking order said, okay, you're, you're the new guy. You get to do those things. I get to move on to other things. Jesus takes a towel, ties it around his waist, pours water in a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And you know this episode. He comes to Simon Peter. Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I'm doing, you do not understand now. But afterward, you will understand. Now, afterward, meaning when the Holy Spirit comes and, and opens up to you the things that I've taught you, that you, you have up there, but you're kind of dull to it right now, and the Holy Spirit will quicken that and begin to make those things come together. So that, so that how much? So that a man who would sit by a fire and deny Jesus to a, to a young lady, a, a maiden, would vehemently deny Jesus is the same guy when the Holy Spirit comes and opens his eyes and his heart, will preach with boldness at the risk of his life. That's what would happen. And so Jesus says, you'll understand later. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. There's that, there's that audacity of a student telling the teacher what the teacher cannot do. We've seen this with Peter before. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no share with me then. Well, of course, Peter, the, ever, ever the one with the pendulum swinging, had a hard time finding the, finding the middle point there. When he swings one way, you'll never wash my feet. says, well, in that case, then, Lord, wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Wash, just give me head to toe bath. If, 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 if washing identifies me with you, I want to be completely identified with you. And Jesus says, the one who's bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. But it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And what he's teaching him there is that this is not about hygiene, Peter. It's about humility. And there's a difference. One writer that I was reading said that he thinks that there's a powerful symbolism in here that the bath, the, that they're, they're all, you're already clean is a symbol for justification. You've already been declared uh, not guilty and accepted as righteous in the sight of God, but that, but that the washing of the feet is sanctification. It's ongoing because your, your feet continue to, to pick up, the, as you move through life, pick up the grime of life, and it has to continue to be washed. He, he sees a powerful image in that, and perhaps that's true. But the primary point Jesus is making here is you must be willing to show your love to one another in the most humbling ways if you're going to be a leader. Now, he's taught this before, the paradox. You want to be first? What did Jesus say? If you want to be first, you need to be what? Last. If you want to be the leader? You need to be what? Servant of all. He's, these are things he's taught. Now he is modeling it with a powerful object lesson. He says, You are clean but not every one of you. Because the scripture says he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said not all of you are clean. So when he washed their feet and put on his outer garments, now he, and resumed his place, so now the rabbi looks like a rabbi again. He looks like their leader and their teacher, but as their leader and their teacher, he's done something to them. We talked this morning about when Jesus spoke about Mary having anointed him with perfume. She has done a beautiful thing to me You know, and sometimes, folks, it may be more difficult to do something kind and merciful and, and humble to somebody than it is to do something for them. Now, why would I say that? Because you can do things for people and be at a distance. You just don't do something to a person, that's up close and personal. That you're, you're, that's nitty-gritty, getting hands dirty. resumes his place. He said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? 
Now, he's already told them they'll understand it later, but he's challenging them to think about it. When the question, do you understand, he's not contradicting himself. He simply is pressing them to think about what you've just seen. Because these folks had grown up around people who had very different philosophies of leadership. The side that the world ignores, serving. Serving both those who are kind and serving those who are not so kind. Serving those who are meek and serving those who are mighty. Serving those who are friendly and serving those who are enemies. And probably we need to continue to learn the lesson because there's still the conflict today between the humble leader and the, and the leader who's too proud to lower himself or humble himself to get involved in other people's lives. I don't know if you were raised like this or not, but I was raised in a climate that taught that, that religion, and of course by that, that's the big umbrella word, but the idea of a person's Christianity and testimony was a private thing. In fact, I was taught growing up, you don't ask a woman what her age is. I still don't do that today, by the way. I'm not going to do that. You don't ask a person who they're going to vote for. I'm, I'm not interested in that, really. That's, that's a private matter. And you don't ask them about their religious experience. That's, that's, that's in the wrong group, folks. <laughs> It doesn't belong in the group with, with, with a woman's age and a person's intention to vote. That's, those, are, those are different things. And yet if, if, if you've grown up doing that, like I, I was taught growing up, then, then you're not going to be inclined to engage. Yet that's exactly what Jesus calls his disciples to do. Look at verse 12 and 13 again. When he had washed at their feet and put on his garments and resumed his place, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. I am. You're right to call me that. You know what he goes on to say in verses 14 and 15? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And it, can you see if you can move that forward to verses 13 and four, 14 and 15? Look at the word ought. If I have done this to you, you ought to to do this to one another. See, we would have expected him to say, if I have done this to you, then you ought to do this to who? Him. This is where I think he, he, he takes them places they never imagined going. Yes, you fellas who fuss with one another about who the greatest one is, you ought to be washing one another's feet, humbling yourself to one another. I've given you an example. You want to be like me? Want to be more like Jesus? Then there's a path that I've laid out. And this is a part of it. You also should do just as I've done to you. So you have this ought, example, and should. This is a challenge to the disciple maker. Do I want to be more like Jesus? Well, that's a, that's a double-edged sword, folks, because it says that in Romans 8, and that golden chain of salvation, that whom he foreknew, he predestined, whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. And the reason for that is that we might be conformed to the image of his Son, that the whole process of salvation is to make us more like him. So, when we answer the question, yes, I want to be like Jesus, it's not like for a follower of Christ, there's an option to say, no, I don't want to be like Jesus. The person that doesn't want to be like Jesus is, by definition, not a follower of Christ. I want to be like you. There's an oughtness then. There's a shouldness then. There's an example. 
then when you think about what was happening in the room that night, when Jesus did this, we have no reason to believe from the, from the text of the scriptures that he left anybody out. He washed the feet of everyone in the room that night. When he did this, he washed Judas's feet. Washing feet not only has the symbolism of humility, but it also has the powerful expression of forgiveness. You can't hold something against a person and stoop and wash their feet. There's a hypocrisy there. You've got to forgive. You've got to let go. You've got to release it. So he's giving this powerful picture here, loving his own to the end. Loving his own in that powerful symbolism and then get them ready for what they would see that... Because because this was this was amazing this was uh, shocking but what they're going to see a few hours later is going to be gory unspeakable and yet it is the ultimate expression of his love for them and for us for Jesus he basically is saying to them if you're going to be like me then you need to obey me and follow my example. And when we boil it down and distill it, it's about love. It's about love. We just mentioned this morning the John 12, it just talked about Judas, and John gave us a commentary on Judas. But there he is in the room he's about to leave it. So Jesus says in John 13, 21, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now notice how he's, he's moved here. I'm going to wash your feet. And he goes around and washes everyone's feet. He's teaching them leadership lessons. And now he informs that, that, that the feet of one of the people whose feet he washed is going to use those feet to go and betray him. That's, that's how powerful servant leadership is has to be to be willing to wash the feet of those who intend to betray you and they might have been able to receive that referencing the spirit the, the, the religious leaders of Judaism the political leaders but to think that somebody in the room there that they had been with three years plus was going to betray him it's, it's reminiscent of Psalm 41, if you want to just jot this down, Psalm 41, 9. Even my close friend, Psalmist said, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. It's really messianic in its tone. In verse 22 of chapter 13, the disciples looked at one another uncertain of whom he spoke. They're, and you can get the picture, can't you? When he says, one of you will betray me, they begin to look around the room. Who would do that? They're wondering. Are you talking about me? Down in verse 25. The disciple leaning back against Jesus. And we know from other passages and putting this together that, that this is John in John's gospel who didn't ever use his name but he's talking about himself. He was the youngest of the, of the disciples, found often reclined near Jesus, looks at him and says, Lord, who is it? And then Jesus doesn't give a name, but he gives a context, he gives an, a hint when he says, it is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. He hands it to him. There should be no doubt. And you'd like to think that that, that would have given Judas pause and he would have said, no, Lord. But he took it. 
And we're told from John that at that moment Satan entered into him and Jesus looked at him and said, what you were doing, do, going to do, do quickly. Now, let me say parenthetically, I do not appreciate the movies that try to portray this and come across as if Judas really didn't want to do this, but Jesus bullied him into it. That's not it at all. Judas is the son of perdition. It was in his heart to betray Jesus. He hung around with them and saw some amazing things for three years, probably did some teaching himself. He shows, as, as John Bunyan says in Pilgrim's Progress, when he's one of his characters, and I can't remember the character tonight, but when he makes his way along the path from the city of destruction to the celestial city, and he comes right up to the gate of the celestial city, and he's standing at the gate, and a door opens over here on the side, and someone reaches out and grabs him and pulls him down to hell. And Bunyan says in Pilgrim's Progress, and then I saw that there is a way to hell, even at the gate of heaven. The teaching of there being, of course, that you can give appearances all along, you can, you can walk with the folks and, and seem to be with the crowd on the right path, but if your heart's not right, if your heart's not right with God, then even though it, for all intent and purposes it looked like the destination was certainly heaven, not necessarily so. Judas is one like that. And so he leaves. The disciples don't seem to understand why he's gone. No one chases him out of the room to stop him. It's almost as if there's a stupor in the room. One commentator described Judas this way. He had played the role. He knew the right words, the right prayers, the right actions, but it was only superficial. There was no taproot, no supernatural source in his life. And one of the leader's realities is working with folks who play the role. They talk right, act right, look right. It's in the case of Judas when the crunch comes, they fold and they'll sell you up the river to save their own skin. That's the description of one writer. And then I came across this story, which I thought was just kind of a warning to all of us, to me and to all of us. I don't know if you know this now, but Leonardo da Vinci took years to paint the Last Supper. Did you know that? I mean, this wasn't something he sat down and did in weeks. Years. And he would look for, for a face, a particular face. He would find someone's face and he would use that face to paint. So he looked the longest for someone for the face of Jesus and the face of Judas. He finally found what he considered the right face for Christ. So he painted that. And then years later, the only face he had not yet painted was that of Judas. One day while walking in the slums of the city, he found a man with a face filled with hate, lined deeply with the struggles of life. The artist had never seen a sadder man. The man sat for the painting, and when da Vinci finished, he asked the man his name, and the man said, Don't you remember me? Several years ago, you used my face as the face of Christ. See, it's important for us to recognize that we've got to guard our hearts. There's remaining sin in all of us. We dare not lay the reins to the neck of our sin. Or it doesn't end well, again referencing John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read that or haven't read in a while, go back and read about the interpreter's house and the man in the iron cage as an example of this. We've got to be fixed and focused on Jesus, not get distracted even by religious activity. And so now we have Christ who is, this was greatly troubling for him. He knew all of it, but to experience it and go through it was greatly troubling for him. Something interesting happens. 
When he, verse 31, when he, that is Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. He's speaking there of something accomplished that really is yet still in the works. Judas has gone to finish the betrayal, to tell the authorities where they can find Jesus. He knew they were going to the Mount of Olives from this Passover service that would become the Lord's Supper. And as painful as all that was going to be, it was going to be to the glory of God. The Son of Man is glorified, God is glorified in him. And when, he, when Judas is dismissed from the room, then the teaching of Jesus shifts. I want you to see this. We're just going to touch this tonight and we're going to, we're going to delve into it more next week. Verse 33, little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You will seek me and just... As I said to the Jews, so now I will also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot go. For 10 months, he's been telling them he was going to die and leave them. And now it's inevitable. It's happening that night. And he's going to cram, one writer said, three years into three hours. In John 14, 15, 16, 17, that evening. He's now going to release them. But he doesn't release them as orphans, as he's going to tell them in, this, in the upper room teaching. He releases them to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who will come. And he says to them in John 13, 34, and 35, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. A new commandment I'm giving you. Now it's not new in terms of the idea had never been posited. In fact, Leviticus 19, 18, we've looked at this before teaches that we're to love our neighbor. But it's new in terms of the one who is giving it. It is, it is new because it is, the, it is the hallmark of the new covenant. It's about to be uh, sealed, enacted in his blood on the cross. It is new because we're to love one another as they to love one another as they had been loved. It's not a not hypothetical idea. What would that look like? They had seen it. They had received it. They've now seen it modeled in a powerful object lesson example. Love one another just as I have loved you. You've seen it. And it carries forth in relationships, by the way. It's, it's not incidental or coincidental that Paul says in, the, in Ephesians, in chapter 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's That's not a new idea at that point. It's simply an extension that in our relationships we're to love one another as Jesus has loved us. So you also are to love one another. And then he says this is really one of the most powerful evangelistic tools that the church has, which is I think while in a lot of places evangelism is not powerful. All people will know and that's not acknowledged there. That's no. They will have an experiential encounter, a true gripping knowledge that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so when churches fight and fuss and fume and split and plot and plan and connive, it's the exact opposite of what he's talking about here. And it was this, by the way, in the early church that just amazed some of the, some of the Jewish writers and the Roman writers, was the love that these people had for one another. In fact, they called, it sounds scandalous today, but they called their gatherings for communion love feasts. 
It wasn't because there was anything illicit or immoral going on. It was just because the hallmark of their relationship with one another was love. That's why when, Adam, when, when, uh, when Ananias and, uh, and Sapphira, when they, when they lied to the Holy Spirit, they're killed immediately. They, they, were, they were going to contaminate this fellowship <coughs> based upon the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ and the love that he had for them as they showed that to one another. You see, love is a verb. 1 John 3, 16 and 17, if you want to look there, says this. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Love is something you do. I can tell you how many people through the years have told me they quote, I just quote, don't, I don't feel like I love so-and-so anymore. Well, certainly love is an emotion. I mean, there's, it's, it's such a powerful experience that emotions are tied up in it. But it's, it's an action verb. 1 Corinthians 13, which we will not take time tonight to read, go read it sometimes, just as love doesn't do this, love, love does this, this... Love is something you do. And then we're going to get into this a little more in John 14, but look at John 14, 15 as we wrap this up tonight. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, how do you know that I love Jesus? Because I tell you I do? Well, that's certainly, certainly I need to say that. I shouldn't keep that to myself. But isn't it manifested in an obedience to his word and a love for others? I mean, isn't that really what sets us apart? That we're not a people who say, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but. No, there's no, there's no but there. I know the Bible says that, and that's painful. And I, I pray, dear God, help me to, help me to, for that to be birthed and grown and manifested in my life. I know I ought to love so-and-so, but. No, there's no, there's no buts there. But. It's the mark. Loving one another and obeying him, which, by the way, is love. That's, you see, First John says, this is love to God that would keep his commandments. And his commandments are not a burden. For those who have been born again, see? For those who have been born again, that's, keeping the commandments is, is a delight. You love God, keep his commandments. The catechism, and I'm going to close with this. Take a three-year-old who's been catechized. Y'all are doing this, Jason with, and Rachel with Judson. He's talking, it's fascinating, he's, him chattering, and he's, he's learning, and he'll give this back to you. Who made you? God made me. Well, what else did God make? God made all things. Well, why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. Well, how do you glorify God? That's the key question. By loving him and doing what he commands. It's just distilled the essence. You're speaking into the life of a child in the hopes and prayers that he or she will grow up to be saved by grace through faith and that the journey for discipleship will not be one where they're scratching their head because from the very beginning it's been woven into the, into the warp and woof of their beings that, to, that by loving him and doing what he commands, John 14, 21, and I close with this. He who has my commandments and keeps them, Jesus says, it is he who loves me. So he's teaching these disciples in these last hours. It's really intensified now. There's no more, no more walking and talking along the way. Consider the lilies. Look at the temple. No. It's the final hours before he goes to be glorified 
and the bloody death of the cross. And he would have us to be ready to be released, to lead with humble servanthood, to lead with love, to lead with a commitment to his word that is more than acknowledging it, more than owning a copy of it, more than reading it, but obeying it. And that's the path of a disciple maker. That's what a person who has, who has come to see, who has come and followed after him, who is coming and to be with him in his cause and be identified with him. And it is the way that you remain in him. Let's talk a few minutes before we're dismissed tonight just to see what's, what the Lord is, how he's stirring your juice in this. Any questions or comments?